Hello, it's Scott Manley here. Yesterday, NASA announced the three finalists for its human lander system for the Artemis program. These finalists all submitted their proposals towards the end of last year. In some cases, they included a big press release to explain how they were going to win. In other cases, the bids were kept much more secret. For example, SpaceX, we knew were bidding. And we knew that they had actually submitted Starship for the commercial lunar payload services. But most people thought that it would not sit well with NASA as a proposal for a human landing system four years hence. So the report on the selection process confirmed that there were five bidders, Blue Origin, the Boeing Corporation, Dynetics, Space Exploration Technologies, and Vivace Corporation, who you've probably never heard of. But the three winners are Dynetics, who will get $253 million, SpaceX, who will get $135 million, and Blue Origin, who's getting $579 million for their national team. Now, the national team is Blue Origin, Northrop Grumman, and Lockheed, while Dynetics is really Sierra Nevada with a whole bunch of smaller contractors. So yeah, Boeing notably didn't even get serious consideration, so we didn't get any details about why their proposal was rejected. Also, Vivace, the only thing we know about them is this one image I could find on their website showing a lunar lander study. I've no idea if this is new or old or what, but it certainly didn't get them very far in the contest. So let's go into the three proposals in, in detail. So the first one is Blue Origin. They are actually going to be mainly concerned with building the descent stage. That will be powered by hydrogen oxygen engines. They're a BE-7 dual expander cycle engines. Uh, this will dock to the second spacecraft, which is a space tug derived from the Cygnus cargo vehicle. That'll, of course, be delivered by Northrop Grumman. And finally, the uh, human part, the habitation module and the ascent vehicle will be developed by Lockheed Martin, and that will sit on top of the whole stack. So the tug stage, its job is to take the whole stack between low lunar orbit and the near rectilinear halo orbit that the gateway spacecraft uh, sits in. Once it gets there, they can leave the tug in low lunar orbit and then the lander will begin its descent towards the lunar surface. One other major contributor to this is Draper, who will be developing the guidance and navigation control systems. So yeah, the whole stack will touch down on target. And because of the height of the lander, there will be a fairly serious ladder that the crew will have to negotiate to get to the lunar surface. One thing that NASA liked about the proposal was that they were going to perform a test of the descent stage by landing it on the moon in 2023, therefore hopefully solving the problems. The ascent stage, of course, it leaves the descent stage on the surface and it returns to orbit and ultimately to the gateway, probably with the help of the tug, but they don't show that in this video. So in a full lunar landing, they can reuse the ascent stage and they can reuse the tug stage, but the descent stage has to be flown out to the moon anew for every single flight. NASA's biggest concern was the power and propulsion system. It, re it relied on some very aggressive development schedules, so it could potentially push the thing out if these were delayed. Overall, it got a technical rating of acceptable and a management rating of very good, but it did get the most money probably because it sits closest to what NASA originally envisaged. The next finalist is Dynetics, which is really led by Sierra Nevada Corporation and about 20 other smaller contractors. Well, ULA isn't exactly a small contractor, but they're a relatively small part of the proposal at this time. So their lander, well, it changed radically from some of the images that I saw being shared earlier in the year. I never figured out, I figured that this must be a hardware lander, but this was included in a number of pages saying this was potentially a human lander. This design is just a whole lot cooler. Here it's being shown launched on a SLS, single stage, exploration upper stage, and it's sitting sideways, you'll note, with four large propellant tanks. By the time it gets to the lunar surface, it will have dropped two of those propellant tanks, but it will still carry all eight of those little engines. Although you can see here that not all of those engines are lit. So as I said, they showed it being launched as a complete unit on SLS's exploration upper stage. 
But they also talked about it being launched on Vulcan in multiple parts and being assembled in orbit. So once it's assembled, it'll make its way to lunar orbit. And while this shows it in space, they did also include an image of it docked to the gateway, which will be a possibility. Uh, I won't read too much into the video because they also include the Orion flying up there on the exploration upper stage, which may or may not be part of their actual plan. Regardless, the crew will jump inside it and that maneuver doesn't make any sense. Whoever did that didn't play Kerbal Space Program. Look, I, I can't criticize it. This is clearly a render by somebody that's trying to make it look good rather than somebody that knows how to play Kerbal Space Program. NASA really liked a lot of things about this design. First of all, the parts that are disposed of are just fuel tanks. They're very simple things that you can ditch and replace. Uh, the landing obviously uses lots of small engines. I believe these will be Vortex engines, which are a design that Sierra Nevada has been working on. The solar panels extend upwards, which will of course support working in the polar regions, which is where everyone's interested. And then the whole thing returns to lunar orbit. So NASA liked a lot about this. Uh, it got a very high score on technical, but uh, they didn't include any test flights prior to the actual landing. Ultimately, I came away with very good technical and very good management, which would seem to be pretty good. It gets about $300 million to try to flesh this out and perhaps do some testing. And so, of course, finally we come to Starship. And yes, yeah, Starship overperforms technically according in terms of the amount of mass delivered, the amount of space. But yeah, it's radically different from the Starship that they've already been showing. I mean, obviously it's roughly the same shape, roughly the same size, but it's missing those fins. Uh, the landing legs look slightly different. I expect those will be modified at some point. It also has these sets of landing jets about halfway up. Those are the three ovals you can see on this side. Because the thing is so darn tall, the astronauts are going to have to use an elevator to get down the site, and they show this using a pulley system. There's one other image that was released as part of this, which shows the Starship just before it lands on the lunar surface, and here it's using these engines you know, halfway up the side of the rocket. Now, these obviously aren't Raptors. If you had nine Raptors firing, then you would have way more thrust than you need. They might be Super Dracos. I'm not sure if they want to get into having two different sets of propellant. But having the engines halfway up the rocket obviously means that you don't have to worry about regolith abrasion quite so much. And now, if you look at the very bottom here, two of the six engines are red. I'm presuming that's because they're glowing red from having recently been used. And what's curious here is you've got one of the large vacuum nozzles sitting kind of uh, at the top of the bottom, so to speak. And on the opposite side from that, you've got one of the smaller sea level nozzles. So they used both of those for slowing down to get in proximity to the surface. And then they switch over to these other engines, possibly Super Dracos, for actually touching down on the surface. You can also see the um, storage canisters in there as well. I imagine that these might contain non-mission specific hardware since changing these out in space may not be possible with the, the you know what we've seen so far. They might even contain emergency supplies, you know, just have your spare oxygen sitting there just in case. So of course, this was the one that we didn't have a video for from the manufacturer. So yeah, we had to make our own and I love flying things in Kerbal. So this is my sort of quick and dirty version. So yeah, what did NASA like about this? Well, they liked that it was incredibly ambitious. They liked that it had a clear future to it where, you know, they could scale up their requirements to quite, you know, you know, to manage any future requirements, I guess. They also really liked that it had a lot of test flights built into the proposal. Like they're going to do an orbital flight with Super Heavy, reflying that. They're going to do a long duration orbital flight. They're going to fly out to uh, beyond low Earth orbit and they're going to do a demo mission all before they will let humans fly on this lander version. The lander version, as we said, it misses the fins. So this is gonna be entirely refueled and dealt with in lunar orbit. This also means that while this is a simpler version in many ways, because it's missing the aerodynamics, it's missing the heat shield, 
It also relies on being refueled in low Earth orbit just to get to the moon. So this means that it requires everything else in the Starship ecosystem at this point. They're going to have to develop the super heavy spacecraft. They're going to have to develop Starship properly and make it reusable, get the aerodynamics figured out, and then build a tanker that they can refly multiple times just to fuel this thing up in low Earth orbit so it can get to the moon and perform the landing. And then they're going to also have to fly tankers out the to the moon to refuel it. I don't think this will return to low Earth orbit because then it doesn't do aero braking particularly well because it doesn't have heat shields. So I suspect that this would have to be met in lunar orbit by a tanker version. One of NASA's biggest concerns about the design was actually the reaction control engines, not the main engines, because the reaction control engines are supposed to run on methane and oxygen and they have to be able to fire and stop very, very quickly to accurately control the vehicle. And we haven't seen any demonstrations of this so far. That being said, I can see exactly why NASA put money into this. I thought SpaceX would have been crazy to bid it, but I mean, I, th I guess it worked. They've got some money to develop Starship and NASA have this potential now that if it works out, this gamble is gonna pay off in big dividends down the line. However, another way to look at it is this is NASA buying essentially 10 months of Starship development time that they can watch and see how SpaceX progresses and whether they get close to fulfilling the schedule that is part of their human landing systems proposal. And if they don't, then that's fine. They've got two other really good options here. And I believe they have potentially the option to pick two of them so that they have uh, dissimilar redundancy. Either of the other two looks like a pretty good bet, although if I was a betting man, I would say that Blue Origins looks like the most likely to actually take the first lander to the surface of the moon. But I think it's great that we have three finalists that are so very different in their strengths and weaknesses and the capabilities that they potentially offer in the near future and the long-term future. And in a year or so, we'll find out which one of these gets to take the first US astronauts to the surface of the moon in a very long time later in the decade. So best of luck to all the teams. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.